Um, and on that note, right, uh, our focus of attention, at least in this part, was to remind ourselves on what sort of things we should look out for when we are reading um, a paper, when we are reading academic literature, right? And, and we're trying to analyze and dissect academic literature, which is what we're going to be doing with this paper-based session. So um, the summaries. So uh, when, when you come across a paper, the question is, you know, how exactly do you read it? Right? You, do, you don't read it, uh, as you already know, you don't read it like uh, you're reading a magazine or, or a blog post or something, right? Um, your interest when you're reading a paper usually is to to, to sort of like extract important information. Uh, so obvious things like the novelty of the paper, um, because a, a peer reviewed academic publication, we usually, um, we usually present things that have not been done before, right? Uh, so uh, things that will probably contribute towards the body, the overall body of knowledge or something, right? So you look, you look out for things like, uh, you know, novelty or new contributions, um, things like um, uh, potential flaws, right, that exist in the paper. I mean, what could, could, could have been done better, for instance? Um, but also, um, I guess when you start part two, things like uh, gaps that exist. Right? Um, while some papers will explicitly uh, state what sort of gaps exist by way of feature work, so towards the end, in the conclusion, a lot of um, academics who, who outline uh, not just the conclusions, but potential future direction. Um, some papers will, will not be explicit, so it's up to you to identify what could be extended, what could be done, right, to extend whatever it is you're reading. Now, there's obviously a lot of ways of approaching this. Um, what I've found useful myself is um, over the years, actually, uh, and in fact, I discovered some of these things when I was a graduate school. Is there's there's people that have um, that have actually written papers on how you're supposed to read an academic paper. Um, so this how to read a paper by by by, by Keshav is a classic. Uh, I'm probably not the only one who recommends this, right? And in fact, most of what we're going to talk about uh, in a short while is really focusing on the ideas in this how to read a paper by Keshav. Uh, it's a classic. But besides that, you have a, you have a paper such as reading a computer science paper, right? Um, by form. Um, I found that this is, uh, whilst the how to read a paper is written by, I think it's a computer scientist, but, but, but the one by form is really quite a, a specific to computing, right? Um, so if I were you, I would, I would look up both of these papers, right? So just go to uh, Google Scholar and just search for how to read a paper or something. And reading a computer science research paper form. Um, so borrowing on Keshav's, uh, so Keshav's uh, technique on how you're supposed to read a paper. Um, the, the thing here, right, is what, what we're trying to understand is, uh, what sort of information do we get from the different, uh, um, you know, structures of the paper you're reading? So a typical paper will comprise of um, certain key portions, right? Obviously, a paper will have the title. Maybe we can perhaps just uh, get one of the, the, the papers here so I can use it as an example, something we're doing here. So a paper, right? Whether it's a conference proceeding, whether it's um, a journal article or something, it will have, um, it will have a title, right? Um, it will have the title, so that will be the, um, anyway, it will have a title, right? Um, and really, uh, if, if, a, if this paper has been written by an experienced academic,
these should Sorry about that. Um, there was a, an interruption. I think, yeah, I don't know if you can hear me now. Can you can you hear me? I think Paul here is. Uh, yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, you can. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, all right. Sorry about that. I think somebody was attempting to get through to me. I'll reach out to them later on. Uh, so you have the title, right? Um, now some people. Some some people will not really craft. Uh, the, the, some people will tell you that your, your title should be crafted in such a way that you properly market your paper, right? In fact, it shouldn't be misleading. It should be representative of what the paper is, is about, right? What you did or something, what problem you're attempting to solve. So, if if I'm to go back to this this example that I gave here, uh, when we are closer to home, I, I don't know I don't know what your thoughts are already here. On, on something like use of data mining techniques in human resource management, you know, don't know, right? Feature selection using genetic algorithm, okay. Um, I don't know, you know. So you have a title, I'm not trying to shoot on anybody here, but you have your title, you also have um, your abstract, you have your introduction, you have, uh, Uh, today is one of those uh, bad days. I do apologize for that. And I hope this thing is still recording. Maybe not, let me just confirm here. Just uh, give me a second. And I think I'm still recording, yes, okay. Um, for those of you that uh, do this often, I don't know if you have uh, but so what we use at UNSA is we use the, the G Suite for education. And uh, during the COVID pandemic, what they had done is they had opened up that, that thing, right? Um, that package at least. So one of the things we're able to do is we're able to easily record, um, uh, record uh, meetings, for instance. That's no longer the case. So that feature is, is gone now. It's typical of these organizations, they'll lock you in and then ask you to pay money, right? But anyway, that's fine. Um, so you have your title, you have your abstract, which is usually um, a, um, people say it's a summary of the paper. Yes, it's a summary of the paper, but uh, with uh, certain specific key information. So a normal abstract should be able to, to include things like uh, the problem or the motivation you know, so what problem, what problem were you attempting to solve? Why did you write this paper in the first place? Usually there's a problem, right? So you look at the problem, the motivation, if it's there, um, you look at the methodology, right? So what exactly did you do, right? Usually an academic piece of writing is associated with research, right? So you outline, you summarize the methodological approach associated with what you did, right? Um, and then you have uh, a short write-up about the key results from, um, from, from the research conducted, right? Um, and then the conclusions, right? So all of that is usually packed in, let's say, anywhere between, um, I would say maybe 200 to 500 words, sometimes maybe more, right? Um, there's usually a limit though. Uh, so back to our example here, this would be our abstract here, I guess. We have to summarize it. 
slightly, I'm not sure if we've gone about the limit here. So this would be your abstract. So reading this, somebody would be able to understand, right? So reading the title may not be uh, you know, sufficient enough, but reading the abstract will give you a comprehensive idea of what the paper is about. And this is important because you don't have to invest, like in this case, you wouldn't have to invest reading 19 pages, right? Of, in some instances, a really technical paper that requires uh, quite a bit of research for you to understand what it's about. Uh, so you have your abstract, um, and then you typically have an introduction, you know, um, uh, you, where you, you talk more about, uh, you talk more about, uh, about the problem space you're exploring. This is where you slot in things like um, your, your, your research objectives or research questions, right, associated with, uh, with the paper that you, you're presenting. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, sorry, if I said 500 pages, um, I, I meant 500 words, sorry. <laughs> There's usually, it's 500 words, I think, sorry. Um, yeah, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I, that was maybe a slip of the tongue, as they say. It's 500 words usually. Um, and these things are usually outlined, right? So if um, to showcase, uh, there's something we're doing with, um, with um, some colleagues and I think, I think one of the templates we are using is uh, somewhere here, I think is here actually. Um, we are attempting to submit work somewhere. I hope it works out. There are two students that are currently in their second year and they happen to be working on similar problems and so we're trying to see if we can co-write, we can co-author something. But you notice that in here, right, uh, for this particular venue, they're saying that, um, um, that the abstract should not exceed a hundred words, you know? Um, so you just, you summarize, in essence, you'd summarize your paper within a hundred words. But this is dependent on the publication venue, which is why I provided the range. It's usually, maybe in this case, I guess the lower bound would be a hundred words or the way up maybe a thousand words, you know, mostly 500 words max. But anyways, um, so you have your introduction and then you have your related work section, right? Where you, you really, um, you, you, you discuss um, existing literature. So uh, things that have been done in the past that are related to the paper. And in most instances, if, if, if the authors don't explicitly state what the novelty of what they did is, of what their key contributions were, you should be able to figure this out in the related way. Because as part of that discussion, this is supposed to be a synthesis, right? A critical review. Um, a normal related work section will have uh, explicitly outlined gaps, right? That exist in literature, you know? Um, in the case of most computer science papers, it's, it's not uncommon to have a, um, uh, an implementation section um, what you will notice for most data mining papers is that the implementation part is usually, it, it will usually be tagged as maybe model implementation or something, right? Um, or maybe uh, uh, model architecture or something. So this is where you outline uh, the, the, the architecture of the models that you have implemented, right? And, and all the things that are tied with your typical data, data, data mining pipeline. So the way data was collected, the, the way data was processed and prepared, you know, uh, what specific estimators did you use, for instance? All of that goes into the implementation. I'm not sure if our example paper has this example in implementation, so this will be introduction there, by the way. Um, then um, quite a lengthy introduction because this is an extended journal article. And then you have your related work section. Um, and then, uh, let's see if we can find implementation. Nope. Um, we have methodology here, right? I don't know if I forgot to talk about methodology here. This we are, there's supposed to be a me dedicated methodology. Uh, it's usually the case that you have, sometimes you might, sometimes you might not. <laughs> so a methodology where you, you just uh, outline how you executed or how you actually conducted this research, right? So if you, let's say you implemented a piece of software and uh, you wanted to evaluate, let's say the usefulness of that, or you implemented a, a model, right? A machine learning model. 
and you want it to evaluate the usefulness to whoever is going to use that, right? Um, you, you, you'd outline the methodology in a dedicated methodology section. So you, you explain to say we recruited, let's say, a hundred participants and then, you know, we had these hundred participants use our model or maybe we split them up into two groups. So 50 of them used our, our solution and then the other 50 uh, performed maybe the same task uh, using the normal way that that task is performed and then you compare the results or something. So you're outlining the methodology, right? So this is usually tied to the research. And in some instances, the methodology, the outcome of the methodology also include, uh, you know, the, the tools that were used to come up with implementation perhaps. But anyway, some instances, the dedicated implementation section, um, I was trying to see if I could find a dedicated implementation section in this paper. Not really, you notice that in our case, it's embedded within the methodology, right? So we have the methodology section, section three, and then part of this methodology has, uh, I, I guess, maybe more implementation at some point, but we have, uh, let's see. <clears throat> we have here, right? So we set up, we implemented a product uh, a repository. Um, you know, uh, we conducted a, a controlled study, right? Uh, I thought there was implementation of the model here somewhere. It looks like we didn't. Uh, it should be somewhere in a dedicated section. Experimental design. Oh, there we go, right? So you notice still under the methodology, this is where we are outlining the implementation. In this case, we are outlining a multi-label subject classifier that was implemented, right? Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, this is not set in stone. This sort of structure, this is just a generic structure. Um, and the order might vary. Um, it's not uncommon for you to find people discussing the related work towards the end, right? Which I always find very strange myself. But anyway, so you also have um, a section dedicated to uh, discussing the evaluation, right? In essence, the results of whatever experiment were designed and executed. Um, and then typically discussion of the results. In some instances, you find that uh, the results and the discussion are combined. You notice this is what we did in this paper, right? So we have section four, it's results and discussion. It's okay for you to separate these into two, two separate sections. So when you come across a paper that has these two sections separated, uh, there's nothing uh, strange about that. Um, and then of course you have the conclusion, right? Um, in some instances, that conclusion will be, will be tagged as conclusion and, uh, and future wake or something, right? So you just you conclude, uh, or you, you touch on important aspects of what you did, um, and then maybe include future, potential future wake or future direction. But uh, in some instances, you find people including recommendations in the conclusion, very common in dissertations but we'll not be summarizing dissertations as part of the paper, uh, paper summaries. It's uh, journal articles and uh, conference papers, um, peer reviewed conference papers or peer reviewed journal articles ideally. Uh, so no technical reports, uh, no manuscripts uh, as in thesis in dissertations. Um, so it's just conference papers and journal publications. And we, we emphasize in peer reviewed work here because we want to make sure that we are reading uh, things that have been vetted. Um, so we will rarely go to archive and pick preprints, right? We will normally go to, um, to reputable sources where we are certain that, um, that um, there was a rigorous peer review process. But anyways, um, I mean, the references obviously. So, so the Kishav, right? Kishav is P three parts, the Kishav approach here. Um, quite simple. He prescribes that you at least go through, not at least actually, saying you, for you to comprehensively understand what the paper is about, you, you go through, you typically go through three passes, right? So in essence, you look through the paper, you read the paper about three times, right? So in, in the first iteration of the first pass, you focus on key uh, aspects of the paper, and specifically what he says is uh, you quickly read the title. So you just glance at the title, you read the title, right? And then you read the abstract and you read the introduction. After that, 
you read the headings, right? So the sub the section, subsection, and sub subsections, um, so that you get an idea of, of how the paper is structured. I guess. And then you read the introduction, and then you quickly glance at the references. Part of the reason why you might want to glance at the references is sometimes you, in most instances actually, when you start reading work in one field, you find uh, recurring entries, things that will appear over and over again, right? These are key papers, ideally. Right? So very simple, this is, uh, the first pass shouldn't really take you more than 20 minutes, to be honest, right? In fact, it's like 10 minutes, actually. So if, if you, if we were to apply the Kishav approach to this journal article, what we're saying is uh, we would um, would come here, we read the title, we read the abstract, we read the introduction, and then we quickly glance at the, the subsections, sub-subsections. So we look at the sections, subsections, sub-subsections, right? Or sub-sub-subsections, if, if there's that, depending on how the paper is structured, ideally, right? Um, and then, all right. And then um, after that, you read the conclusion, right? So once you go through these, so you're just reading the, the subsection, you're just reading the headings essentially, right? These things, you get a sense of how the paper is structured. And then you, you, you get to the conclusion, you read the conclusion, right? Or you read the concluding remarks. And then you glance at the references, right? You look at the references. So you would have uh, completed pass number one, right? Pretty straightforward. The key though, right? Is that once you go through the first pass, uh, what Kishav says, and you probably understand this once you start applying this approach. I'm hoping you apply this approach uh, once we ask you to go through and read the trial paper here. You should be able to classify the paper, right? So in computing, for instance, you have uh, papers falling in various uh, categories, right? So it could be a theory-based paper, right? It could be theoretical, it could be experimental paper. It could be implementation specific where a piece of software was implemented, for instance, right? If it's experimental, then maybe just a series of experiments were conducted. If it's theory, then maybe it's just largely theoretical, right? Maybe it's tied to theoretical computer science or something. But the key thing is you should be able to classify the paper, right? And maybe classify it based on field or something. Is it data mining? Is it you know software engineering? Um, is it digital libraries, for instance? Is it educational technology? You know, is it um, is it an algorithms paper or something? But that falls under theory anyway. Uh, computer theory, uh, computer science theory. Um, but you should also be able to, to, to contextualize the paper and what context was this paper written in, right? And then obvious things like you should be able to assess the relative correctness of the paper. So these things, right? These things that people write. Human beings write these things. There are errors and we're not talking about typos or of course it's okay to spot the typos, but we're not talking about typos, right? We're talking, talking about things like uh, graphs that appear out of the ordinary, right? You look at a graph and you're thinking, well, oh, there's something wrong here. And, and, and this is how people have been able to identify papers that have information that was doctored. It's very common, right? Fraud is uh, quite prevalent in academia, in case you didn't know. And rightfully so, people are in part rewarded based on these things, right? So the UNSA, for instance, will promote a person like Jackson, Mayumbo, Lighton, or Sam, for instance, in part based on their research output. So how many journal articles and conference papers did you publish, right? Or have you published? You know, and because of that, some people are tempted, right? Temptation. But uh, hopefully once they teach us about ethics in, in the research methods course, we'll be able to understand and appreciate the fact that uh, fabricating results is a bad thing. Uh, people, people fabricate things, right? You, you look at a graph like this and you realize, no, if only this graph was all the way up to here and coming here, and then you superimpose it or something and you rub off this thing, right? This is what people do. It's quite sad, really. But of course, there's a workaround now. Increasingly, people are requesting that you also share data sets, right? <laughs> so that, so that uh, your, your colleagues are able to reproduce what you did. But anyways, uh, so you should be able to assess the correctness um, and of course, you should, you should know what the novelty of the paper was, right? What were the key contributions of the authors to the paper, right? Uh, in the event that uh, these authors, I don't know if we did state our contributions in this paper here, maybe not, 
Uh, oh, this is quite sad. Ah. What? This is shocking. We didn't explicitly state the contributions. Okay, that's fine. Um, this is wrong. We can change this. But but you can't understand this. Um, you know, it's implied, I guess. So anyway, so if it's a paper like this where these authors, right, have, have not bothered to to um, <laughs> to state the key contributions of, of what they did, then after the first pass, you as as a person who is skilled at reading academic literature should be able to determine the key contributions of these people, right? Um, and hopefully, um, you should be able to ascertain the clarity associated with the paper. But anyway, so that's the first part. It shouldn't take you more than 20, 30 minutes. And, and the reason I'm saying 20, 30 minutes is because you're reading the introduction and the conclusion. In some instances, if it's a journal article, it would be a lengthy introduction. If you look at this, right? This is an extended journal article. So you notice that uh, the introduction here, it's, it's kind of bulky, right? We're starting at line number 052 here, all the way, all the way up to here, right? Line number. Um, I guess 124 or something. And so this thing is spanning about a page or something. This is two columns, of course. But anyway, that's okay. Um, so we straightforward stuff here. And then pass number two, right? So this is the second iteration. Um, when you're doing this for the first time, you don't have to do these passes back to back, right? So let's say you spend 30 minutes going through pass number one and then you immediately go to pass number two sometimes, maybe you go and brew a of coffee or something, or maybe you get back to work. And then somewhere around lunch, if you are doing pass one, uh, uh, if you are moonlighting, you're doing pass one, maybe in the morning at work, pass number two in the afternoon, um, you you now analyze the floats, right? So the floats would be graphs and you know formulas, equations, uh, tables, right? These all constitute floats, right? So you pay particular attention to things like these, right? Um, and charts, actually, images, right? So things like these, try and understand these things. Uh, do you have floats? Do you have, uh, no equations here, but tables, right? These are all floats. You look at tables, the table captions, the contents of the tables, um, the plots, right? Or graphs or charts, I don't know what they call it, it's a plot though. Um, you know, if, if they are called snippets, not, this is not complex code here, this is just meant for illustration, this is basic XML. But there are some papers that will have um, complex code snippets, right? Algorithms, for instance, right? So you look at all those things, um, you know, uh, all the graphs. Um, and then you, you take a note of key references, right? That you haven't read before. Remember in pass number one, you're just scanning through the, uh, the references, the reference list. After you scan it through, what you do is you take a note of the references that you haven't read before. So if it's a, it's a paper like this, you go to the reference here, right? You notice that we have quite a number of references. So as you're reading this, um, you, you start taking note, oh, have, you read, uh, have you read this classic, you know, uh, by uh, um, William Arms, for instance? If not, you take a note of that, right? Um, and and the, the thing here, right, the thing to note here is by the time you're done with pass number two, you'd have really a firm sense of what the paper is about. You'd actually comprehensively understand the paper. And I don't know if it's Kisha of a form uh, will say that uh, you'd have gotten to a stage where you can maybe hopefully replicate the paper, right? You, you can do what the authors did because you understand what the, uh, the paper is about. And then in pass number three, you know, uh, the focus really would be on, on things like uh, some key flaws, problems that you noticed about the paper. It would be like methodological flaws, for instance, right? Um, things to do with experimental design. So somebody tells you, oh, we, we did a uh, within study uh, experiment, it was quantitative in nature, and then all of a sudden they tell you to say, well, we how we recruited uh, five participants and you sit there and you say, wait a minute, right? If it's a quantitative study, how is it that you, you only recruited five participants, right? Things of that nature. So the focus here really is you are looking for flaws. There are always flaws in papers, right? Almost always, you know, depending on the venue anyway. 
And we're not talking about typos here. Of course, it's nice to identify typos, but uh, important things that have implications, right? On, on the conclusions of the paper. You know, because if your methodology is flawed, then you, you start asking, well, can we generalize the outcomes then? You know? Um, can we reproduce what you did or something? Uh, sorry, I'm going to pause here and just ask if people are still with me and if all of this is making sense, if, if this has been done before, uh, if you've done this before elsewhere or something, I'm interested in hearing people's thoughts about this. I mean, we're done with the Kishav approach. I don't know if people have questions about 